Hi, everybody. In these times of the COVID-19 pandemic, we all got introduced to at least one kind of molecule of life, messenger RNA. Today, I want to talk about three kinds of molecules of life and outline the history during the last 80 years of how knowledge of, about these molecules was accrued and how the basis for the development of the vaccines that we are now using have been obtained. The molecules of life, DNA, RNA, and proteins are all in their chemical structure linear arrays built of a limited number of chemical building blocks. In the case of DNA, and actually also in the case of the messenger RNA that we are all familiar with by now, the building blocks consist of a group of four nucleotides. In the case of proteins, we have also a linear array of solidly linked building blocks. In proteins, there are 20 different building blocks, and just as in the nucleic acids, they are arranged in a linear fashion. And as you can see from this image at the bottom, these chains have a direction. And this can quite nicely be illustrated with belts that we use in daily life. Because a belt has a uniquely defined end on the left and on the right. And this black belt represents DNA. This black belt represents messenger RNA and the brown belt represents protein. It is a basic law of molecular biology that these linear molecules can be copied. DNA can be copied on DNA, so-called replication, DNA can be copied to RNA in transcription, and RNA can be translated into protein by translation. Why translation? Because here we have to transfer from an alphabet of four building blocks to an alphabet of 20 building blocks. However, it's important point to be made here is that the nucleic acids are linear chains that are read in a predetermined direction and the same is true for proteins. Now you have all heard about messenger RNA vaccines that are being used to fight attacks by corona viruses. Because proteins are produced by copying RNA, it is possible to inject or a person with messenger RNA. Although the desired effect of the vaccine is clearly associated with protein, what then happens is that the translation occurs in our own body. This is, the body is given the RNA and its own machinery then produces a protein that has the desired action of the vaccine. It is actually so that there are also attempts to inject vaccines with DNA, 
which would then be transcribed to RNA and subsequently translated to protein. It is actually so that at this very moment, a company in India has applied for a license to produce a vaccine based on DNA rather than on messenger RNA. Here you have the central dogma of molecular biology in a different presentation. This drawing actually dates from the early 1960s. You see, DNA, the curved arrow indicates that it can replicate itself. The solid arrow from DNA to RNA shows the way that uh, information that we find eventually in proteins is transferred from the DNA to the RNA and then from the RNA to the protein. Now here is an additional important piece of information. The RNA is very short-lived, whereas DNA and proteins are relatively stable. In biology in general, this gives the opportunity to regulate the processes in our body. If, if a certain protein is no longer needed, it is sufficient to deplete the pool of RNA to stop the production of the protein. When we talk about the COVID-19 vaccines, it means that after a short while, after getting the injection, no trace of the injected material is found in the body because the RNA that was injected will be rapidly decomposed and metabolized. Now, so far, we can well understand the functions of these molecules by just looking at their linear chemical structure. However, when we then look at the wide spectrum of functions that are performed by proteins, proteins are used for our protection. Now, skin is made of protein, hair is made of protein. Proteins catalyze chemical reactions in our body as enzymes. And the functions of these enzymes are regulated by yet other proteins, the hormones, and there are also transport functions of proteins, such as the transport of oxygen that we inhale in our lungs by hemoglobin, which then transports this oxygen to our brain and all around our body. So, in order to understand how this relatively simple linear chemical structure can perform this wide range of different functions, we need to know more. We need to know about three-dimensional structures. And I want to illustrate this to you with an old example where we studied a protein, cyclophilin, and a drug that binds to this protein. It was an and still is an important drug because it is a drug that opens a way to use organ transplantation in human medicine. So you see here a picture of that receptor protein and the drug bound. The light blue part of the image is the receptor protein. The darker and speckled part is the bound drug. Now, how do we have to fancy that such a structure comes about? Well, so linear array of the polypeptide chain is folded in space, three-dimensional space. And so we do not see a cross, 
to structure because of the material that is presented by the amino acids and we only look onto the surface. Now, what does this mean? This means that we can now study in detail the area on the surface of the protein where the drug molecule binds. And we now know exactly what the shape of this surface area is. And we can then look at the drug. Cyclosporin A is in itself a small cyclic protein with 11 amino acids. And we can then start to think about where individual groups of that drug might fit better than in the original form. And chemists might then modify this chemical structure so that it would bind more tightly to the receptor molecule and thus, for example, enable one to reduce unwanted side effects of a given drug. Here, we would modify the drug so that it would fit best to the receptor protein. However, there is also the possibility that we learn from studies of the three-dimensional structure of a protein how we could modify this protein in order to achieve advantageous properties. A striking example is presented here by this study of the coronavirus S protein trimer. So this is a protein that stands out on the surface of coronaviruses such as SARS-CoV-2. And one of my colleagues at the Scripps Research Institute, Andrew Ward, has determined the three-dimensional structure of the protein about six years ago. And it is a very complex structure that you can see on the left side of this image. It's a structure that consists of thousands of atoms and was studied by cryo-electron microscopy. What Ward and his colleagues then observed was that in the region that is emphasized by red and yellow color in the image on the left and which is shown isolated on the right, he discovered that at the end of the structure in a hairpin-like form, the structure was not stable. And whenever the monomeric structure, that is this one structure, associated with two other of its kind to form the physiological trimer, then this structure would refold into a different shape. And so, in the natural form, the protein could not be used as a model to train antibodies to fight attacking viruses, which is the function you expect of a vaccine. So by looking at the three-dimensional structure, Ward and his colleagues went back to the chemical structure and found that the critical energetically unfavored spot was exactly here. And so they started to replace amino acids in this position. I mean, replace the given natural building blocks with different building blocks. And they found out that they, if they introduced two residues of a special kind, these residues are called prolines, in this position, the strain on the structure would be relieved and the three-dimensional structure would be maintained in the monomeric form as well as in the trimeric form. And that makes a protein now a good target for the training of 
the defense system of our body to uh, be active against an attack of this virus. So again, if I summarize, the principle is we look at the folded forms of the proteins. We find that at a certain point in the folded form, something special happens. We unfold, we look at the sequence, and we can start to work at very different locations, usually on the polypeptide chain, in order to modify the properties of the protein in a rational way. Here you have a detailed picture of the work done on the spike protein by the Ward group. You see here the natural amino acids, asparagine and leucine, 1067 and 1068 are replaced by two proline residues. So three-dimensional structures are the key to understanding function of proteins. They are the key to many things from biomedical research, drug development, agriculture, and so on. So methods to determine three-dimensional structures are X-ray crystallography, which has been successful since about 1957, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance in solution, since about 1984, and cryoelectron microscopy, only very recently. I put here since 2012, but really it has been uh, effective only since about 2016. Now, where are the origins of these methods? Because this talk is meant to introduce you to the history of this area of research. Well, X-rays were first produced and measured by Röntgen in 1895. And Röntgen was the first recipient of a physics Nobel Prize in 1901. By the way, I put stars on each name that of a scientist who was awarded a Nobel Prize. And you can see from my slides that methods development has been a very important part of the overall research in chemistry, in the life sciences, and in physics. So in 1912, Bragg, Bragg and von Laue independently discovered that X-rays are diffracted in crystals, where Bragg and Bragg are father and son who work together, and they are the only father and son uh, combination that was jointly awarded a Nobel Prize for the same project. And all these were Nobel Prizes in physics. In 1933, the first electron microscope was built in Germany by Ruska. And in the 1930s, a number of scientists started to record X-ray fiber diagrams of structural proteins. The bio biology at that time was not in a position to produce biological macromolecules in a form that would be amenable to structural studies, except for fibrillar proteins, such as hair or fibrils extracted from the skin or from tendons. And these structural proteins could be studied by irradiation with X-ray beams that were applied perpendicular to the direction of the fibrils. And by about 1935, the X-ray fiber diagrams were used to differentiate between 
different proteins. On the one hand, the KMEF group, that's keratin, myosin, epidermin, and fibrinogen. This is what you see uh, on the outside of your body. And collagen, that is the fibril protein, the structural protein that is used in our tendons. In 1938, the scientist, Dr. Asbury, published a poem in the Transactions of the Faraday Society. It says, Amino Acids in Chains. And for me, this is the most surprising thing. I believe that this is the first time that someone says straight out that proteins consist of amino acids that are linked together in chains. Are the cause, though the X-ray explains, of the stretching of wool and its strength when you pull and show why it shrinks when it drains. Now, what's the background to this? The background is that Australia and New Zealand were producing a lot of wool products. They had an intense interest in learning about wool. And so these structural studies of fibrous proteins were primarily conducted in Australia and in New Zealand. There was no question of having a three-dimensional structure at atomic resolution. This had to wait for another two decades, but actually started in the 1930s with studies by Corey and Pauling of very small pieces of proteins, namely, on the one hand, individual amino acids, and more importantly, two amino acids linked to a so-called dipeptide. And from these studies, they obtained accurate dimensions for the amino acids, the peptide bones, that is, the bones that link different amino acids in the protein chain and the overall dimensions of dipeptides. In 1944, a scientist with the name of Avery demonstrated that the genetic material is DNA and not, as was previously believed, protein. It was such a surprise that's not very long ago, much less than a hundred years ago. It was so much of a surprise to the community that DNA should have the role of genetic material that Avery was not believed and he actually died before others confirmed his results in the 1950s. Otherwise, he would certainly have a star with his name. Now, in 51, polling used the data obtained from the crystallographic studies of dipeptides, as I mentioned above, to model the alpha helix and the beta sheet secondary structure in proteins. That means an alpha helix is formed by my belt in this way, and the beta sheet would be is best illustrated by a hairpin structure. In 1953, the, double, the DNA double helix model was proposed by Crick, Franklin, Watson and Wilkins. And this is not a structure, this is again, just as with uh, structural proteins, this is a model based on fiber diffractions and there is not enough information actually to, co to construct a structure. You have to build models that would with all likelihood fit those few data that were experimentally determined and as you will see, it was only in 1980 that a proof was given 
that the DNA double helix of 1953 is really one of the shapes that the DNA adopts in our bodies. In 54, Ramachandran, an Indian scientist, developed the collagen triple helix. In 55, Sanger determined for the first time the ordering of the building blocks along the chain in a protein. And in 1956, Ramachandran developed the so-called Ramachandran plot. I will illustrate this in just a minute, which is based primarily on the data measured by polling in the early times from 1936 to 1950, where he obtained exact dimensions of amino acids and dipeptides. And finally, in 1959, a low resolution crystal structure was obtained for myoglobin and hemoglobin by Kendrew and Perutz. I want to illustrate the last two achievements because they have a very, on this list, because they have a very strong influence on the work that we are doing today. This is the Ramachandran plot and, of course, the first structure of a protein. Now, what you see here is a drawing of two neighboring amino acids linked by a covalent bond. So this is the type of structure that was studied by Pauling and Corey in the early days. And then Ramachandran generalized this. You see in the center of this picture, there are two arrows and the Greek letters phi and psi. These describe rotations about the bones between what is called the alpha carbon, and in the lower part, N, the nitrogen atom of the following residue, and in the upper part, the linkage from the alpha carbon to the carbonyl carbon of the preceding amino acid residues. And what he found is that only a small part of the region, of the conformational region spanned by these two angles is sterically allowed. In the extreme case of a particular amino acid residue, valine, and also in isoleucine, the allowed region is a small a 7% for other amino acids for all except one, it is less than 20%, and that is an absolutely dominating effect even today when we are working on three-dimensional structures. Each and every three-dimensional structure is initially checked by neutral bodies using the Ramachandran diagrams for not containing serious errors in the interpretation of the experimental data. But now, just a few words about myoglobin and hemoglobin. You see here Dr. Max Perutz holding a chain, just as I hold here a belt. He is holding a somewhat more detailed uh, picture of a linear chain of a protein. And it is of this linear chain, which is a bit longer than uh, in his picture than my belt here, he determined the three-dimensional structure. But what this means is that he could define some overall features. There was no question of seeing individual atoms or similar. This uh, model consists of laminated wood platelets that had been cut out to fit uh, 
the experimental data that were available. And one can see there is a spot which is identified by the letter O. This is what we call the heme group. That is where the oxygen is bound when the hemoglobin passes through our lungs. And this part of the history of structural biology was formally concluded in 1962 by the award of the Nobel Prizes in Chemistry and in Medicine to Wilkins from left, uh, Perutz, Crick, then you have Steinbeck, the Literature Laureate, Watson and John Kendrew. What happened then in the 1960s? We have talked a lot about the messenger RNA today already. The messenger RNA was discovered at around 1960 in discussions by Crick, uh, Brenner, Jake Jacobs, and many others contributed. And the existence of the messenger RNA as an intermediate between DNA and protein was essential to understand the regulation of biochemical reactions in our, our body as represented, for example, by the LAC operon and in the same, uh, at the same time there was also the discovery of allosteric. And at this point I need to use this dice for this occasion to illustrate to you what is meant with allosteric with active sites. So when you fold a protein, as you have seen, you get an active site, which is represented here by this yellow spot. And you have seen the active site in the protein cyclophilin, where it binds the drug cyclosporin A. So three-dimensional structure determination tells us where that active site is. Now it is possible that we identify not only the active site, but the second site where small molecules might also preferentially bound. And this gives us now the possibility, for example, in drug design, to work with fragment-based methods to find compounds that would bind to both of these binding sites, usually bind much more strongly, and as a result, might be much more potent lead compounds in drug development projects. More complicated is it when we look at the backside of the protein. There we may also have binding sites. And what these scientists in 1961 discovered was that it was possible to bind certain modulators to the back of the protein and influence the activity of the active site. And this can be over a distance that is very long on the scale of molecular structures. So today, work on, uh, I'm getting back to drug design again and again, is not concentrated only on the active site. It includes studies of neighboring sites that might be occupied by one and the same drug candidate. But even more, we may have just one active site here, and then we look elsewhere in the back of the molecule for allosteric sites where we might also use drugs to affect the reaction that we want to influence in order to improve the situation of people that need to be treated with a particular drug. 
at the end, I'm jumping here. So we then have in the 1960s work by a scientist with the name of Anfinson who showed that if you have a linear structure with a given sequence of the building blocks, then this determines in a unique way the three-dimensional structure. Then in 1962, restriction enzymes were discovered. In 1965, a sequence of a tRNA was determined. Now, tRNA is a different kind of RNA, but when we compare to a typical messenger RNA, then the tRNA is only a small piece in the length. And so it was possible with the methods used by Holly to determine the sequence of the four building blocks along the linear the structure of the tRNA. And then the genetic code, that is the code by which we can go from the four letter alphabets of nucleic acids to the 20 letter alphabets of proteins has been determined in 1965. And in 1968, the first important biological structure by electron microscopy was obtained. Again, it was a model based on incomplete data sets of a particular virus, the bacteriophage T4. And at the end of the 1960s, there were exactly nine different proteins of which the crystal structure has been determined. This is an unusually small development given that successful crystallography had been described uh, 10 years earlier. Now, these nine proteins were myoglobin, hemoglobin, cytochrome C, lysozyme, ribonuclease A, ribonuclease S, papain, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase A. Now, why only nine proteins? Well, the reason is very simple. The biochemistry of proteins was not sufficiently developed at that time to prepare other proteins for structural studies. These are all proteins that can quite easily be isolated in sufficiently large quantities from natural sources to be subjected to studies by structural biology methods. In that uh, scientist, Dick Dickerson, and an artist, Erwin Geis, published a book in which they made protein structures accessible to a general public. At this point in 1969, NMR in structural biology was also started. For example, uh, an NMR spectrum of my hemoglobin was recorded. You see, it's hemoglobin KW, and you can see that it has a small number of broad lines. Or a more exciting example, you see here the crystal structure of cytochrome C, which actually was determined by Dickerson, uh, one of the authors of the book. And then Erwin Geis rendered a more pleasing detailed structure where he inserted all the atoms, which had never been seen individually in the crystallographic data. And in the NMR spectrum, we then got very neat resolved lines on the extreme right the left of the spectrum, and from these lines we could uh, actually add to the precision of the structure determination that was obtained by the low-resolution X-ray crystallography. 1970s, 
introduced genetic engineering, which really led to the big development of structural biology 20 years later. Then for the first time, a tRNA structure was determined by Klug and Rich. In the mid-1970s, powerful X-ray sources were introduced in synchrotron beamlines for protein crystallography. Also in 75, electron microscopy provided a low resolution structure of a GPCR, bacterial rhodopsin. And Frank developed mathematical methods that made it possible 40 years later to analyze efficiently and correctly data obtained by cryo-electron microscopy. In 1977, DNA was sequenced by Gilbert and Sanger. So Sanger here received his second chemistry Nobel Prize. And I need to say a few words about the impact of the sequencing of DNA. In the method used by Holly to sequence a tRNA was tried out on a larger gene, on a genome of an RNA virus, Qbeta, which consists of about 4,000 nucleotides. Working for many years with large groups, different methods around the world, including here in Zurich, were able to approach the sequence through about 400 nucleotides at one end and 1,200 nucleotides at the other end, leaving about 2,000 and some nucleotides in the middle. So this was work by, I would estimate, 50 graduate students and postdocs during 10 years. After the introduction of DNA sequencing, this work was completed in one day. Just a very striking change in the way uh, research in biology general and in particular also in structural biology could be performed. And in 1980, finally, the first time a DNA structure, not a model, a DNA structure was determined. The reason for this delay for what is it, uh, for almost 40 years since uh, Crick Watson uh, double helix is that up to then no one was able to synthesize short fragments of DNA in sufficient quantities to grow crystals or to make solutions for NMR to study the DNA in detail. And I show here from the 70s a model of the tRNA crystal structure determined by Alex Rich, who was so enjoyed by his work that he built a gold-plated model of the tRNA. And here you see the three different DNA structures that were determined by single crystal X-ray crystallography in around 1980, A DNA, B DNA, and Z DNA, and B DNA corresponds largely to the model that Watson and Crick proposed in 1953. How did we go on? In 1983, the crystal structure of a large membrane protein was determined. In 1984, another important contribution to cryo-electron microscopy was obtained by Dubochet and many other groups, vitrification of electron microscopy samples. This was of very little impact and interest for the best part of 30 years, and all of a sudden 
with the development of new technology for electron microscopy, uh, Dubosche was recognized for this very early work. In 1985, the first NMR structure of a protein in solution was completed and mass spectrometry of proteins was introduced, which today is an incredibly important method in proteomics and an analytical tool also to support structural biology. And in 1986, the polymerase chain reaction was introduced. Everybody uses PCR in the lab every day today. The change in the ways uh, biological laboratories worked was at least as big as after the uh, development of the method of DNA sequencing that I described a few minutes ago. When we look forward to the 21st century, important foundations are an electron microscopy structure of bacterial adopsin by Henderson. More powerful X-ray sources were introduced, so-called third-generation synchrotron beam lines in NMR, transverse relaxation optimized spectroscopy or DROSI opened the ways to study much larger particles, much larger molecules than previously and actually also led to a wide array of different new NMR approaches for studies of proteins. Starting in 2000, at least three countries financed structural genomics projects, which differed in classical structural biology by uh, choosing the targets for structure determination from among unknown proteins, just expressing so far unknown parts of the genome to obtain entirely novel information on proteins for which usually the structures were not yet known. And also starting in 2000, we were able to work not only with the DNA sequence of the human genome, but with complete sequences of hundreds of genomes from viruses, bacteria, all the way uh, through uh, mammalian, a, a, a wide range of mammalian species up to the refinement over the years of the information on the human genome. In the 1990s, Wayne Hendrickson and myself took, the, took up the project of publishing a volume at the end of each year of describing in short abstracts all the structures that were published in the preceding year. Here you see the cover of Macromolecular Structures 1992, which describes the structures uh, determined in 1991. And here are some numbers. See, up to 1990, the number of new structures per year was like 120, 130. In the mid-1990s, we are already at 500, and by the end of the decade, we approached the number of 1,000, and that's when we gave up to publish a book and left the uh, collection of the uh, of the information to a uh, digital uh, data bank. But it shows you that during the last decade of the 20th century, crystallography and NMR evolved into methods that were very powerful at the start of the 21st century. Cryo-electron microscopy has not yet a uh, measurable impact. 
And then I have here in the final slide a summary of what I feel are the most important developments in structural biology so far in the 21st century. Without going into details, I can say that structures have been obtained for ever more complex combinations, usually of two, three, or a larger number of macromolecules, not just individual proteins. The most important impact came from the introduction of entirely novel methodology for cryo-electron microscopy. The total number of structures solved in November 2021 in the protein data bank is more than 160,000 crystal structures. So you see, at the, after the end of the 1990s, things really exploded. There were more than 13,000 NMR structures and already more than 9,000 electron microscopy structures of proteins, nucleic acids, and supramolecular assemblies. And I would not want to stop without indicating that computational methods have very recently come up with astonishing results, and it appears that right now, in 2021, a giant step has been made to complement experimental structure determination with structure calculation based on artificial intelligence methods. I thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure to have been with you.